Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circuit Python Weekly for February 24th, 2020. I'm Katni, and I'm sponsored to work uh, sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. And Circuit Python development is sponsored by Adafruit, so please support them by purchasing hardware at adafruit.com. Uh, this meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. Uh, we hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens at, on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we will notify you via Discord. Uh, if you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. Just let us know. Uh, this meeting is recorded. We record audio from the voice channel and video from the text channel. If you are interested in participating but don't want your voice recorded or don't have a microphone, you can still uh, join us. And we have a notes document that accompanies the meeting uh, wherein you can put your uh, updates and we will read them off during the meeting um, for you. Uh, as well, if you are participating in the meeting, it's also excellent to add your status updates and hug reports to the notes doc um, as we do post that document to GitHub in the end as a transcript of the meeting and um, we also uh, link to it from the video. The video of the meeting is posted to YouTube and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find that this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news, which is an overview of all things in CircuitPython going on in the community. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka which is a statistical overview of the entire project. Uh, it gives us an idea of what's going on by the numbers. The third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to call people out for doing something good. Uh, we take a moment to talk about uh, over the past week, um, things that we want to highlight uh, that others have been doing. Uh, the fourth part is status updates. Uh, this is where we take a couple minutes to talk about what we've been doing over the past week and what we will be doing over the next week until the next meeting. Um, it's uh, an opportunity to sync up, to really hear what's going on with everybody in the community, but also to get tips and tricks from others. If you are blocked on something and someone else has an idea for you, it's a good time to talk about that. The fifth part is called In the Weeds. And in the weeds is more uh, long form discussions. Um, so if there's something that you wanna talk about that doesn't fit into status updates, feel free to post it to the notes doc or to the CircuitPython text channel and we'll get it added to the notes doc and we can talk about it then. Uh, it's also an opportunity if something comes out of status updates that turns into a long form discussion, we can bump it to in the weeds. And that is how the meeting goes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil with Community News. All right, thank you, Kenny. You're welcome. All right, first up, uh, this is kind of neat. I've seen some projects like this before, but this is a specific circuit Python library for getting the output of some digital calipers and using circuit Python. So that'll be in our newsletter. I'm gonna try this out because we have those calipers and it's all made with circuit. Python. A um, couple things going on in the world of uh, Engineers Week that have something to do with either CircuitPython or some of the stuff we've been up to. Um, you could check out DigiKeys, things that they, DigiKey, what they did. They did a uh, girls' night out for Engineers Week where they did CircuitPython, Circuit, uh, Circuit Playground projects with MakeCode, and a bunch more. Check out those. And then Morgan Stanley, um, they have a makerspace program. Um, I'm kind of interested in all these different large organizations trying to figure out how they can do the most with things like coding and coming together and how do you teach in like a half an hour. Um, and this is just yet another example. So um, this is kind of neat. 
you can check out the link that I posted there and uh, you can look at their makerspace program. Next up, Feather Previews, Arturo has been posting them. There's some great photos on Twitter and some great photos on Instagram. This is the new CircuitPython powered Feather with an NXP chip. So this is coming along. Next up, um, Hackspace is launching in the US and uh, the new issue's out. There's a Python on hardware article from Drew and from Ben, the editor. And um, we additionally had a show with Ben, the editor, where we talked about their new strategy to come to the US. They gave us a special link if you want to subscribe. Um, we don't get any money or anything like this. We just said we'll help them out. And you can check out that interview with Ben. They've been. Um, really good spotting all the talent that's out there and also specifically the Python on hardware trend. And uh, Drew, who y'all know from probably Oshpark or um, is working on the Open Hardware Summit badge, is uh, has an article in there and it's all about Python on hardware. So things are moving along. Um, today, just right before we got on the air here, as they say, uh, there is new part day on Hackaday, and you can check out the clue. And then uh, last up, there's a good thread on Twitter from uh, Noobcat, and the, the question was, what's the most intimidating part of hardware development to you if you ever had doubts about starting first project with microcontrollers? And there's a bunch of replies. And scrolling through those, I feel like we did a good collective job hitting a lot of those with CircuitPython. Uh, there's more work to do ahead, but it was neat to see some of the um, things that people struggle with, whether it be downloading an IDE or tool chains or updating firmware or which programming language to use, or sometimes people can solder, sometimes they can't, but they still want to get some type of sensor information in. So there's a lot of things that um, that was that was neat to see, and there's a lot of activity on that. So I'm going to add that to our newsletter. Um, in addition to some of the other things that I saw recently, um, there's photographers that are using CircuitPython for lighting rigs, and they're like, this was just really easy. And then a lot of people who used to program, and then they're programming again, but they just wanted to do a hello world. And our hello world in the world of electronics is blinking stuff and hearing how how easy it is from their point of view to do this. So it's kind of a good timing for both of those things. And uh, this will go out tomorrow, Tuesday at 11 a.m. And still in draft if anyone wants to do any pull requests or more. And thank you everyone for tweeting and tagging things with CircuitPython. Makes it easy for us to find and keeps the newsletter stock full of goodies. And that is the community news this week. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. All right, next up is the state of CircuitPython and the libraries and Blinka. So this is a statistical overview of the entire project by the numbers. It gives us an idea of the health of the project and uh, gives us a chance to just see where things are at um, separate from what it is that we are up to. Uh, so first we'll talk about the project overall, then Scott will talk about the core, then I will talk about the libraries, and Melissa will talk about Blinka. Uh, so you will get in a general idea of what's going on, and then we'll be able to talk about things more specifically. So first up, um, overall, we had 29 pull requests merged from 15 authors. There's some new names here. Um, F. Galaire, uh, Vifino, and uh, Mubes, I think, is also new. Uh, so thanks everybody who just joined us and thanks to everyone who's continued to contribute. And we had seven reviewers. As for issues, we had 21 closed issues by 10 people and 10 opened by 10, nine people, leaving us net down by quite a bit, uh, which is excellent. Um, I know that we are, overall, we're pushing through 5.0. Um, trying to get to release candidates, so that's part of why a lot of issues are getting closed, uh, is that we are uh, working through the final issues in 5.0 to get to where um, we want to be for a release candidate. The best thing that you can do if you want to help out with that is to run the latest version of CircuitPython on your project and let us know if you find anything. Uh, same thing once the release candidate goes out, please, please, please just test it with everything you're already doing um, and it helps us a lot. File any issues for anything you find. 
uh, even if it turns out to be nothing, it's still very helpful to us to know that we have um, things that we should be taking a look at. Um, and as for the libraries, uh, we are continuing to increase them. Uh, we're continuing to get um, more uh, contributions, which is excellent. And if you're interested in getting started with CircuitPython, um, reviewing PRs is a good way to get started. Um, there is a list at uh, circuitpython.org slash contributing where you can take a look there and uh, pick something out, take a look at it. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, just take a look at the code, see if um, anything sticks out to you, and just note that you didn't test it but um, either found an issue or that you think it looks good. And uh, it's super helpful to us. So we are happy to help you get started with that. If you are unfamiliar with Git and GitHub, we are absolutely happy to get you started with um, learning that. We have a guide on it, um, but we also can help you out uh, on Discord or um, once you have a GitHub account on GitHub. So with that, I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. Whoa, sorry, I had to unmute in two places since I have uh, jackhammering on in the background. <laughs> so uh, for the core, uh, we had 12 pull requests merged from seven different authors. Uh, thanks to the new folks, uh, F. Gallier, Maholi, Mubes, and the other four are folks I recognize. So thank you to all seven authors. Uh, we have four reviewers, so thanks to those four reviewers as well. Uh, again, uh, we we really love having more reviewers. So if you're interested in getting started, let us know, and we're happy to help you do that. Uh, we have five open pull requests, which is kind of a local minimum for us, which is great. Uh, thank you to all the reviewers for helping make that happen. Issues-wise, we had 12 closed issues by five people, three open by three people. So we're net down nine, which is amazing for a total of 250 open issues. If you want to see a list of all the open issues, you can go to github.com slash Adafruit slash CircuitPython slash issues to see them all. We have eight active milestones. We have two open on 500. We have uh, five open feature requests for 5x, and we have uh, 13 open bug fixes that would go in a 5xx release. Uh, we also have 26 open issues on 6.0, which is interesting, and we will get to those soon. Uh, we have zero open or zero issues not assigned to milestone, so that's really great, uh, and that's really good to keep track of and prioritize things as well. Um, we don't have any download stats for CircuitPython currently because uh, I think we've broken GitHub about it. Uh, I may take a look at that this week uh, because I would love to see download stats again here. Uh, besides that, that's it for the core. All right, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Next up is the libraries. So all of this information applies to all 200 and uh, something. <laughs> I don't know the number off the top of my head. Uh, libraries that we have, um, this is uh, over all of them. We had 17 pull requests merged by 10 authors. Uh, Vifino is the new name that I recognize there, and thank you to everybody else who has continued to contribute. And we had six reviewers, um, leaving us with uh, 26 open pull requests. Um, we have a list of merged pull requests in the notes. Uh, the oldest one was six days, and there are uh, probably about eight that we managed to close within zero or one day. So that's excellent that we've been keeping on top of that. We had nine closed issues by six people and seven open by seven people, so we are net down two for 143 open issues. To see the list of open issues and open pull requests, please visit circuitpython.org slash contributing. Um, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had two new libraries, the LPS2X and CircuitPython BLE Eddystone, and a number of updated libraries as well, the list of which I will not read, but it is in the notes. And with that, I will turn it over to Melissa to talk about Blinka. Hello. So, uh, for Blinka, we have we, the, this Blinka is our circuit Python compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. And we had one pull request merged by one author and three reviewers. Uh, there's two open pull requests to date. And 
There was one closed issue by one person and one open by one person, leaving a net of 33 open issues. There have been 2,284 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we currently are supporting 38 boards, although I believe there is a um, pull request open for adding another board. Excellent. All right, thanks, Melissa. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things that people are doing uh, in the community. Um, we do this in a round robin where I will start as an example, and then I will go down the list alphabetically and we'll loop back to the top. Um, when I get to you, uh, go ahead and take a couple minutes to um, talk about uh, whatever it is you would like to highlight um, for other people. And uh, if you are lurking, um, you probably have already let us know. Um, and if you are text only, lurking or missing the meeting and you have notes in the document, I will read them off as I get to you in the list or as I get to the person who may or may not be in the meeting. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So with that, I will start. Um, first and foremost, I want to give a hug report to Ed Keys on Discord for helping out all over the place. Uh, I see them popping up in every channel that I check, uh, providing really excellent support to other members of the community, and it's just really great to see. Um, they are fairly new to the community, which is also excellent. Um, they joined within the last couple months, I think, and have really jumped in headfirst, and um, they, uh, they're doing really great, so I wanted to, to call them out for that. Um, thanks to Geek Guy for testing some PyBadger code for me. I had to make one change and um, I needed it tested just, it wasn't going to break anything, but you never want to release something without testing it. So thank you for that. Um, and thanks to John Park also for testing the PyBadger code for me so I could finally get a giant refactor PR merged uh, and be done with that. Thanks to Mika Melissa for testing my PyBadger code throughout the entire process of that refactor um, and for help last week simplifying code and making some display IO code work and for unblocking me. Um, a lot of help from Melissa last week. And then finally to Crayola for helping me with writing some code and getting me past the final issues I was having. All right, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello, let's see here. Scroll. Okay. Uh, I wanted to give a hug report to Cater for reviewing my Arduino uh, EPD uh, pull request. Uh, one for Foamy Guy for helping test the PyBadger pull request, which made it easier for me. And a uh, group hug, uh, especially those who are patiently waiting on me for reviewing my PRs still. All right. And that's it. Thanks. Next up is MS Costi. Uh, hi, I have a group hug for everybody, and then a group hug or hug to Dan H for getting a 5.0 release candidate. Excellent. Next, I have some notes from Sedacious, who says, "Hug to C Grover for helping me with a MOSFET question." and to Dan H for looking into an I2C bug that proved to either be working as intended or a rather severe corner case. Next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug to Dan for really uh, taking it upon himself to squash as many bugs before 5.0 as he possibly can. Uh, so we're super close to release candidate. Um, should be see that today or tomorrow, I think. Uh, so thanks to Dan for doing most of that work. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to Foamy Guy for prototyping the BLE quilt example we talked about last week. I think that uh, looks even better than I imagined it already. So that's super exciting. Um, thank you to Lady Ada. Uh, on Friday, she tried out the Raspberry Pi bridge for broadcast net and uh, had good results. She had one crash and then it ran all weekend. So not entirely sure why that was the case. Uh, but I will take a look at it this week. And uh, it's been working pretty well for me as well. So 
uh, for those of you who have sensors around your house, uh, Beely is a pretty cool way to do it. Uh, it doesn't have range of LoRa or anything, but uh, it's pretty simple. And we should see more of that in the next couple of weeks. And then lastly, uh, thank you to Mesa177, uh, Allah from Beirut, for uh, just creating a PR for the initial Arabic translation of CircuitPython. Uh, I reached out to them after the YouTube video of their CircuitPython day from last year, and they've been gung-ho to get started and help out uh, bringing uh, CircuitPython to Ar Arabic-speaking folks. So uh, thank you again to Mesa177, and I'm looking forward to working with you all more. All right. That's it for me. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Next up, I have notes from Andrew Tribble, who has a group hug. Um, and then I also have notes from C. Grover, who also has a group hug. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, -da -da. And then I have some notes from Code and Solder. Um, who has a hug for JP for BLE videos and a group hug for everyone. Next up is Dan. Okay, um, let me scroll backwards, sorry. Uh, I'd like to thank Foamy Guy and Geek Guy uh, in um, Discord for helping out with a bunch of people. And I always try to look for people who I can uh, point out who are helping, but I'm forgetting some people. Like There have been a lot. We've had a lot of people who are helping more and more. It's really helpful. Other people are mentioning other people in, in here, so that's great. Okay, that's it. All right, thanks. Um, next up is David Gloud, who is text only, so I will read it off. Uh, to hug for Dan H for support on the BLE Heart Rate Library and a group hug for everyone else. I have notes from Dew Wester, who is also lurking, who says hug report to Foamy Guy for once again for the TLC with my clue this time. And next up is Foamy Guy. Yep, uh, this week I got hugs uh, for Scott um, for merging uh, and reviewing a, a PR I made over the weekend on the request library, as well as let me pick his brain a little bit on uh, the BLE stuff last night. And then um, Dan uh, tested out an issue I saw in my clue and uh, also got me um, fixed up on a driver problem I was having on the edge board. And then uh, lastly, I had uh, Marius450. He made uh, some great uh, efficiency improvements on the, the turtle library. Um, he got it working on the, the Circuit Playground Express even. Um, so that's really cool. I had a lot of fun playing with that. All right, excellent. Uh, next, I have notes from Geek Guy, who says, uh, hugs to Katni for letting me test and poke at her code, and a group hug to everyone because you are all awesome. Thank you. Next up is Higher Effect. Yep. Hello, hello. Hi. Um, sorry. Uh, just a group hug for me this week since I've been sick. Ah, well, glad. hopefully you're feeling better. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, I have notes from Jeff Epler, who is missing the meeting, um, who has a group hug. And last up is Jerry. Yeah, and just another group hug for everybody. Nice to see all the stuff going on. Excellent. And that is Hug Reports. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next up is Status Updates. Status Updates is a chance to take a couple minutes and talk about what you're doing. Uh, it gives us all the opportunity to hear what everyone's up to and also to provide any tips and tricks we may have for anything that is blocking anyone. We hold this also in a round robin, uh, same as hug reports. I will start and we'll go down the list um, and loop back around 
and give everyone a chance who would like one to talk or I will read off your notes um, when we get to you in the list if you are text only or lurking or missing the meeting. So I will get started. Uh, last week I wrote up a guide page for a simple slideshow example for Clue. Uh, it uses the buttons to cycle through images uh, just using the slideshow library uh, from CircuitPython and um, we wrote that up uh, just to give an idea of uh, how to do it on Clue. Uh, I finished a complete refactor on the PyBadger library to include Clue and made it expandable to future boards, um, which uh, similar to the refactor that I did on the Circuit Playground library, um, it uh, has different modules now for different boards and automatically detects the board. So that was a breaking change. Uh, if you have previous code that used the PyBadger library, you will need to change how you import the library for the new, um, the way that the new library works. There were no functional changes to it, so the rest of the code should work exactly the same. Um, I started working on a badge example for Clue by expanding on the current specific Hello My Name Is style badge. This turned into porting some of the code from the Clue library into PyBadger to make a super customizable badge, which I began testing on PyGamer because the smaller display needed to be made to work before moving on to the Clue display. Got the custom badge function working how I wanted to get it on PyGamer. And then uh, today, tested that on PyBadge, worked exactly the same, which is how it should have worked. Um, and then moved on to Clue and was able to create a custom basic badge on Clue as well um, with fairly similar code, uh, but slightly different because obviously the display is much um, higher resolution on Clue. So this week, I want to, the, the last thing I want to add to the custom badge that uh, I created is the ability to use a bitmap as the background. Um, struggling with that, but I want to get that added in. Um, I think it will expand PyBadger's, I mean, I know it will expand PyBadger's functionality beyond um, simply being a, a, a conference badge library. Um, the idea being that uh, you will be able to use it to just display display lines of text um, using display IO, but without having to do all the setup. And that was part of why I wanted to add the bitmap background was so that you could create, you know, anything you want with a bitmap and then put text over it and have it work very simply. Um, so I want to get that added in. Uh, and then I need to finish the clue badge example which is going to involve adding something else, probably QR code, to one of the buttons, and then uh, it will use the buttons to switch between those two modes. Simple, but um, at least that will get um, anyone who uses that example um, be able to expand on using the buttons uh, from that example. And then I'm going to write a guide page um, or a full guide for the clue badge example. I'm not sure which, depends on how big it gets. If it's if it's more than a page, then obviously it needs its own guide. Uh, and another miscellaneous, I need to update the schematics on GitHub and in the guide for the Feather Huzzah ESP8266, we made a change that helps people not break things <laughs> with it. And uh, the schematics were never updated um, online, so that needs to be done. And then we made a change to the code of conduct on Discord and uh, we want to have that change be part of the Adafruit community code of conduct across the board. Um, so sometime this week, ideally, uh, I will be learning how to do an Adabot patch and we'll be updating the code of conduct across the libraries um, and in cookie cutter and so on so that all new libraries have the change. Um, and uh, that is where I'm at. So with that, we will go to make a Melissa. Hello. So last week I reviewed and merged in some waiting PRs. I created an Arduino fix for the ePaper display gizmo to work uh, with the Circuit Playground Express because Currently, it was only set up to work on the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. 
um, but it works on both now. Uh, I worked with mostly with familiarizing myself with uh, web Bluetooth and adapting a web application to make it so it can connect to the circuit playground Bluetooth and display some of the sensor information. Uh, and I tested out Ketney's Pivadger PR and verified it worked well. Uh, this week I'm going to work on and possibly finish up the web Bluetooth dashboard application to see um, various aspects of the circuit program Bluefruit, and I wanted to also work with the Clue board and probably some other boards. And that's it for me. Excellent. Next up is MS Costi. Hello. So for the past few weeks, I've been working a lot on my uh, Microsoft Surface Dial project that uses the CircuitPython Bluefruit. Specifically, I've been doing many, many uh, test prints and revisions to the 3D model in order to get it working uh, the way I want it to. Finally got to a state that is mostly functional and I'm mostly happy with. Um, upcoming is I'm going to, once the 5.0 release candidate is out, I want to test the project again with that. And then I'm planning on pulling out um, some code that could be put into a library. Uh, it's a magnetometer-based encoder um, that should work for any magnetometer as long as the X, Y, and Z data is available in the same interface. And then I also want to separate um, or make a new uh, project repo that includes the CAD files for this project and then the source code for the project. Excellent. Thank you. Next up, I have notes from Entol, uh, who spent Friday at Lego with Tufts folk, who Dan H knows, for a Lego hack day with lots of MicroPython, CircuitPython things going on in the Lego spike device. Just wanted to let you folks know that it went well, and it was very friendly, and plenty of UK makery types at the event were CircuitPython enthusiasts. Nice one. Next, I have notes from Sedacious. Who last week published both LPS2X libraries, finished tester code for the LPS2X, added LPS2X to Sensor Lab, wrote Arduino and CircuitPython drivers for the HTS221, wrote tester code for HTS221 and worked on two add-ons for the Open Hardware Summit badge, should be sending them out today or tomorrow. This week, guides for HTS-221 and LPS-25 started bringing up testing and libraries for either the SI-1133 or the ICM-20948, sending uh, OHS boards to FAB and working on code for the OHS badge. And next up is Scott. Hello. Okay, uh, one thing I did last week was I turned off the BLE file service and prep for 5.0. I think I mentioned it last week, but I just wanted to make sure that people couldn't create a virus uh, that would propagate around PyCon uh, via the BLE file service, which didn't have any permissions checking or anything. Uh, we'll circle back to that uh, in the coming months because it's still a really good idea. Um, right now, I'm focusing on BroadcastNet, which is a Beely advertising-based kind of like sensor network reporting thing. Very dumb, uh, but uh, relatively reliable and e definitely easy to use. Uh, I redid the Raspberry Pi scanning and got it much more reliable. I had been using this library called Bleak, and I dug into the weeds because it didn't seem like I was getting uh, more than one advertisement per time I asked it to scan. And it turned out that uh, there was some deduplication happening at the kernel level, which was not fun. Uh, but I figured out a way and, and realized why other people took a different approach. Uh, and I made that work. And that means that we get basically every advertisement, which is awesome. Um, or at least we get duplicates again. Because it's advertising, you never know whether it'll actually get anywhere. Uh, but it's actually looking pretty good, which is cool. Uh, I ran it all weekend. Um, and it's been collecting data around my house, which has been really neat. Um, this week is kind of a weird week for me. I had a last minute wedding, uh, crop up in, uh, Colorado this weekend. So because I'm heading to Colorado, I thought it would be cool to actually, uh, try to visit spark fun and great Scott gadgets. Uh, it's not my wedding. I'm already married. 
uh, but a friend of ours, they decided to uh, they decided to get married on the 29th of February, which only happens every four years. And so once they just picked up at that date, they kind of like decided to do it. So we're we're on board. Colorado should be fun. Uh, so I'm out completely on Friday because I will be skiing with them. And then on Thursday, I'm actually uh, leaving early in the morning, uh, getting into Denver about noon. And then it looks like I'll have lunch with Kate from Great Scott Gadgets and then head to Spark Fun at three and uh, meet some Spark Fun folks there as well. So uh, that should be really cool. I'm excited uh, and happy that those folks are willing to meet up. Um, and I'll report back uh, next week on that. Um, so this week before I leave, I've got three full days to get stuff done. Uh, I'll be polishing up BroadcastNet and really trying to get it released and pushed. Uh, I want to get logging of the battery levels on the sensors I have going working because that's going to be what I want to work on next week is uh, getting the sensors to run a longer time without having to be recharged or having their batteries replaced. And then um, one of the, the things that I'd like to fix before 5.0 is, and, and I'm surprised I'm the only one that's run into this, but uh, CircuitPython can actually crash Max, uh, which is outrageous, and they should fix that. Uh, but we could also fix it on our end. And so I reproduced it over the weekend uh, twice, so I, I know how to make it. I know how to tickle the bug, and I've got logs of the USB, uh, why it was happening. So I, I should be able to just figure it out. out. And I, I fixed it once. I think I only fixed it in certain cases, not all cases. Uh, it only happens now if you like eject your CircuitPython drive, but then leave it plugged into your Mac, and then it goes to sleep, and then it wakes up, and it tries to get it going again, and it can't. Um, so yeah, I'll probably take a look at that, uh, in the next couple days as well. Cause I, I would like to block at least not, not necessarily the release candidate for five, but, uh, the actual stable five, I would like to, I'd like to fix that bug. Cause it's just a huge pain. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Thanks Scott. Mm -hmm. Next up, I have notes from Andrew Tribble. Uh, okay. Uh, last week. Got a suite of test boards and sensors. Spent the later half of the week trying to find out if there is support for an I2S microphone. Played with some examples for e-ink displays and the HT16K33 with 1x4 14 segments. This week, continue work on I2S input if possible and check out turning the graphing utility into a library. Next, I have... Uh, wait... Next up, I believe, is Charles. Ah, well, I just received a uh, a, a, a replacement module uh, for for my uh, uh, draw bars draw bar system. And I'm going to I got to figure out how to wire it in, and then then we'll be all set to demo my V3 emulation because I'll have all the mechanical parts ready. So wish me luck on that one. Good luck. Yeah, I need it. <laughs> it's very confusing. Have a good week. Have a good week. Thank you. All right. Next, I have notes from Code and Solder. Last week, nothing new, dealing with back pain. We'll be finalizing PyCon Circuit Python poster presentation project. And next up is Dan. Okay, so as mentioned, we're I haven't released we haven't released 500 RC yet. Uh, we hope to do it really soon. So I've been just uh, squashing a lot of remaining bugs. Um, there was an issue with OS.stat. It wouldn't work on non-long end builds, like on the um, Trinket or some and some other builds. Uh, the two bytes operation, which a lot of people don't use, didn't uh, do signed integers, just unsigned. Um, those are all both kind of boring. More interesting, um, there was a bug in uh, NeoPixel Write. Uh, on the NRF that caused it to crash after it was running for a while. And um, Roy had, um, 
also known as Crayola, had worked on this PR, but uh, got involved in some other stuff. So I, I finished it off and tested it, and it's now working now. So now you can do um, NeoPixels reliably on NRF at a fast speed. It's working pretty nicely. And uh, finally, there was another uh, thing where we need to enable um, the so-called soft device, which is the uh, flash library, proprietary flash library that we use for BLE um, on the NRF. And we were like trying to set it up in various ways at various places. And it turns out there's a feature that we didn't know about until I found it by accident that if you import a native module, you can turn on a flag and have that thing uh, run some code when it's imported, kind of like underscore, underscore init, underscore, underscore dot pi in regular Python code. So I did that. And now whenever you import underscore BLAIO, BLA it will enable Bluetooth, which works out very nicely, which is exactly what you want. Um, I needed to look at some, uh, some people are having trouble with various M4 boards, maybe losing their bootloader. So I ended up looking at the forums uh, late last week and over the weekend and ended up doing a lot of forum support. And this is helpful. It's somewhat time consuming, but it also means sort of like, what are the latest crop of problems that are, a number of people are seeing? So it's always good for the developers to do uh, forum support, uh, and not just um, CircuitPython, support, CircuitPython channel support as well. Um, finally, what's gonna happen this week is we're gonna really try to finish off uh, 500 release candidate. Uh, and there's some, a bunch of miscellaneous things I have to check on too. And then after RC, the RC is finished and we release 500 as a, um, for general availability, I have as big projects to do. Um, there's a lot of issues with the current UF2 bootloader uh, that we really have to clean up and I'll work on those. And also a number of us are interested in working on um, making it possible to uh, really do low power mode in CircuitPython so that when you sleep, it'll really sleep, as Scott says. And this means we have to change the way we do timekeeping inside and also um, do, make some other changes so that we can, we can figure out what to turn off to, for sleeping. OK, that's it. All right, thanks, Dan. Next up, I have notes from David Gloud. Last week made a clue color reading and transmitting in BLE as a proof of concept for a PyCon 2020 badge app. Uh, ordered a bit to Pi that converts from micro bit to Raspberry Pi pinout. Next week, long term, drive Raspberry Pi hat uh, or bonnet from a clue with the bit to Pi and maybe improve the clue badge concept using the proximity or display top three received advertisements on the screen. Uh, I believe Duester is lurking, so next up is Foamy Guy. Uh, hi, yep. Um, so let's see, last week I had uh, I finished up the Neotrels M4 um, synthesizer example and got the PR created for that. Um, I spent a little time over the weekend uh, playing with the request library, uh, adding support to post data more like how uh, it would come from a, an HTML form. Um, and then uh, the turtle graphics I mentioned before, I did a little bit of playing with that on the Circuit Playground Express um, and also on the Clue as well. And then uh, the other uh, thing I got done this last week was um, I picked up a 16 by 8 uh, LED matrix um, feather wing. So I got a chance this weekend to get that all soldered together, assembled, and start uh, learning about the library that drives that. Um, and then for next week on my plate right now, I'm looking at um, need to get uh, polished up the Pi Gamer uh, Pi Gat badge um, tile map game example, and then um, I was going to work some on uh, the BLE patchwork demo for the Clue, um, and it will also uh, probably end up working just as well on the Circuit Playground Bluefruit and Gizmo by the time it's done. Um, and then uh, I also want to play some more with the 16 by 8 matrix. In particular, I want to try to make a way to uh, easily draw some text on there uh, and have it scroll across. So that will be on my plate this week. All right. 
Um, next up, I have notes from Geek Guy, who says, I am working on another change, the HT16K337 by 14 alphanumeric display animations. It consists of passing a list of lists for the bit masks, so any or all displays can have different animations concurrently. The way things will work will be triggered by how the bit masks are passed in a single list or a list of lists. I will also be continuing to poke at my Pi Gamer so I can continue to learn how to use it. I will be starting writing, I will start writing applications for it like a wireless remote control for machines. And next up is Higher Effect. Oh, I, uh, I was pretty sick last week. Um, sorry, just reading your, your notes, Scott. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I came down with the flu real bad. Um, so I didn't get a whole lot done. Uh, but, uh, I did get started on the pulse out implementation. Um, so, uh, going to be working on that before moving on to the F7 and H7 implementations we're planning for the CircuitPython SDM32 port, um, as well as uh, Rotary I.O. So, I'm kind of working on all of those uh, still this week. Um, I also did a lot of uh, work on my Zephyr tutorial, which is now almost done. Uh, just needs a little bit of extra editing, but... Um, uh, yeah, this week I will be just trying to wrap up Pulse Out uh, with some nice controls with uh, IR, IR LEDs and sensors, um, working on uh, scoping out rotary I.O. Um, and what work is involved for that, and uh, doing whatever work still needs to be done in uh, my Zephyr guide. So that's it for me. All right. Thank you. Jacob is lurking, so next up is Jerry. All right, where's there it is. Um, <clears throat> so, not a whole lot of circuit Python activity last week. I, I was away for most of the previous two weeks, so I've been doing a lot of catch up. Uh, things like uh, yesterday's what well, should have been a ten minute faucet repair it was a seven hour project with two trips to the hardware store and now a new faucet instead of just a repaired one. But it's done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so, and I finally got my my Raspberry Pi bird cam deployed. I put, put a couple of pictures up. It's a little uh, bluebird house with a solar-powered Raspberry Pi Zero W in it, and some um, a camera, infrared camera. It's some LEDs. So the bottom picture is a uh, looking in there. The, no birds have found it yet. It's only been out there for a day. And they'll, they'll probably, hopefully, move in next month. So looking forward to watching some birds. And um, so next week, I'm now going to get back to some serious work on this this long-standing RFM 699X issues I've been working on. And um, really think about how to separate some of the Circuit Python from the Raspberry Pi issues because they really are quite different in what I'm dealing with. But more on that as I work on it. And just uh, trying to deal with all the too many toys I have to play with. Schedule them. <laughs> good, good problems to have. You're right. All right. And that is status updates. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next up is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. If you have any In the Weeds topics, please post them while we are discussing other In the Weeds topics so that we are not waiting around um, with a bunch of silence uh, to find out if anyone has any more topics. There are two topics listed, and so first I'm going to turn it over to Jerry for the first topic. Yeah, this is just really uh, looking for some guidance um, in, in working on this RFM stuff that, you know, the original version of it was written really, I think, somewhat quickly to, to get something working. It's, it's meant to be Radiohead compatible, um, but it, you know, has some limited, and we, we've expanded it some over the last couple of years. And now in looking at it and trying to make it expanded a lot more, I'm realizing that there are a bunch of things that I really would have liked to have done differently. So... Is there a problem to, you know, how, how big a problem are breaking changes in a, in a library like this? Especially in this case, I'm thinking what it's going to break is mostly the things that I don't think anybody's even using anyway. 
Um, at least I don't know of a lot of people using it. So, and my goal is to make it probably more like the Radiohead implementation, particularly, you know, the example I'm working on now is the way we pass in information to control the Radiohead header is I have, you pass in a tuple with the, this four byte header, which really the way it's done in Radiohead and probably would be a lot simpler is to make those properties um, and use getters and setters to control them. Um, anyway, could do it in a backward compatible way, but that would kind of bloat the code. So, so just, you know, breaking changes it... are acceptable. It's just, we need to document. Okay. That's, that's the big key is that we have to stay on top of current documentation. Um, as in, let's say there's guides that use right. the current code. We have to make sure that we find those before we release a breaking change. Um, make sure yeah. that the release notes are thorough and then make sure all the examples are updated and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think you're probably, your assessment of it is probably accurate. And I do agree that bringing it closer to um, how we do other libraries with, you know, with more properties like you're suggesting is, is probably a good idea. Good. Okay. And I think I'm, I'm hopeful that it can be done in a way that doesn't break the guide um because the guide uses some very basic stuff so uh, my whole goal is to hope is to keep it so that it doesn't break the guide but okay. adds a lot of new stuff that has never been well documented <laughs> so okay. all right um, i'll go ahead and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and do it and and then you know we'll discuss it when the pr comes in yes absolutely and that's that's a perfect way to do it Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds sounds good to me, Jerry. And I think it's important that we do break things from time to time because we want people to have practice updating stuff. Okay. Um, they can always use the older version if they need to as well. Great. Looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is a topic from Carter. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. Excellent. Um, sure. It's more of a question, which hopefully won't make me get a uh, volunteer to do it. But just <laughs> think, thinking ahead that, you know, 5.0 is getting coming out and BLE is kind of the big flagship new thing for it. It's sound, it's and I've run into this when I've done a few BLE projects. I've gotten them done, but I kind of like was putting bits and pieces from all over the place together. So it seems to me like it's going to be a really good idea to have a BLE standalone guide similar to the display IO guide. Hey, Carter. Yes. You want to write a BLE guide? <laughs> so I, I will, and I'll do it because I, when I got done with the display IO guide, I really knew display IO well. Yeah. And I appreciated having gone through that journey and doing that. And I, I'm kind of motivated to do the same thing for BLE because I would like to do it. But I will, if anyone else wants to do it, uh, feel free to speak up right now. It's it's a really good opportunity to put together a good guide and learn something in depth. So I can do it, but I will let someone else raise their hand first if they want it. To, to be and honest then, with and, you, I would, I would love to take it on. It's just not like I don't have the cycles for it um, for that very reason is to learn the BLE stuff much more thoroughly. Um, but that will be what reading your guide is for. Yeah, um, it, it took me, I, I'm all told it was over several weeks putting that together. So it wasn't non-trivial. And then the other thing is um, Scott's availability during that time was very crucial too. I had several one hour-ish chats with him mm -hmm. when I put that guide together that were critical. So I mean, you can I, always, you can always get my time. Yeah. Right. Would it be Except you, Scott, when I'm skiing on Dan? Friday? Would it be Dan this time or would it be you? It seems to me like this would be more like Dan's turn. I mean, either of us, we both know it pretty well. Um, and there has been some work that we've done with JP for like single page stuff that's gone into some of his guides because he's been doing like we've been doing the back end work on those guides and then he's been writing the guides themselves. And so I think there is a there's a page that has some glossary stuff on it that we definitely like reviewed for him and, and, and helped him with. Um, I think the other challenge with our BLE guide story in particular is that kind of, we, we have a lot of legacy stuff as well. Whereas like display IO was kind of something completely new and different. Like BLE is one of these things that like, you know, K town wrote a guide four years ago, all about BLE. And it's like, and I wrote an intro guide that is BLE and circuit Python, but it's not, 
utilizing what we yeah. have now. Right. So, so I think it, it may be less writing from scratch and more mm -hmm. just like coalescing all the disparate stuff, like you were saying. Um, but if you also just need help learning it, I'm, I'm always here and happy to help. I think I've actually been thinking about doing a talk for teardown all about learning BLE through circuit Python as well. Uh, I think that's going to be what I pitch to, to talk about there. So, um, isn't I, the, the, um, the circuit Python underscore BLE library, that's, isn't that a relatively new thing that's been put together in collaboration with the five O all the five O stuff? Yeah. I mean, it was, it's been around a while given that like we've been working on five O a while. Right. Um, and I think right before 4X was released, we decided to make it underscore BLEIO. Um, and I'm not talking about the actual module. I'm talking about the uh, the CircuitPython library. So the library, the, the API changed completely incompatibly. There were several major versions. Like 102 is the 4X compatible one. Mm -hmm. And then it changed completely as, 5, as the 5O alphas and betas came out. Right. So yeah, the library itself is older, but there are a number of things that are just don't work any. They they don't work the same way at all. Um, right. Because I kind of look at that repo as being what the the guide would kind of be a how to use that library repo. Yeah. Like ninety ninety percent of it, you'd have some intro material about what BLE is, the fact that the core module in the firmware is underscore and why that is, and you know just mm -hmm. kind of stay away from it. And now you use this library, and then. But you look at the library layout and it's, you know, it's kind of, if you just jump right into it, it's not super obvious what's going on. It's like, well, right. what, what is an attribute? What's a characteristic? What's a service? What's this advertising folder all about? Yeah. And How that's piece, like pieces the... all together to get something simple done. Right. And I, that's, I actually asked Lamar about this recently because the radio library that Entol did is really interesting. And I think it's what people, a lot of people need. Um, and I was, she mentioned that you were working on a guide for that as well. Um, Am I? <laughs> I? I mean, she thought you were. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, working on it. I'm working on some clue. A clue. Oh, okay. Radio. What do you mean by radio? I'm working like, on like we have idea. a radio. We have a radio library that is meant to be the same API as the microbit radio API. Oh yeah. Where okay. you like set a channel and you listen for messages. Um, and it's actually just like Beely advertising under the hood. Right. Um, whereas on the micro bit, it's like straight up 2.4 gigahertz radio. It's not even Beely. Um, but it's meant so that you could like port code from micro bit radio into circuit Python and Beely and not know the difference. Right. Yeah. So what I'm working on is yet another, it'll be like a clue based fun thing that shows how to do that, which it is fine, but. I, I think kind just of like a, a, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say just a heads up too. I, I last week I tried to do something with that radio library and I think it's broken in the current with the current okay. um stuff. So yeah, I believe it because we haven't been using it. Right. Okay. But I see that as yet another fun thing to do with clue. I think a good yeah, you know, nuts and bolts guide, standalone nuts and bolts guide would also be a very useful thing to have out there. Dan, do yeah. you still plan on writing that wrapper library that does a lot of the, Here's the Bluetooth setup? That, that would be nice. And I'm not, it was, I was originally going to write it for Bluefruit Connect. Yeah. It's easier to do because for that, it's a little harder to do for the general case. Oh, okay. But that's something to consider too, Carter, is that there's an awful lot of code inside. If you look at like, Python code or something. There's a lot of like, okay, let's try to connect. Okay, oh, oh, are we still connected? If we're still connected, go ahead. Uh oh, this thing returned none. We better try and connect again. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the kind of the looping of like checking and recovering from being disconnected and reconnected, uh, it would be nice to hide that. And if you can think about writing a uh, like I was thinking of writing a library called Easy BLE, but basically I only have the name. Okay, 
And uh, it was originally for Blue Food Connect, which is sort of the simplest case, but we've gone way beyond that. Um, but still, if there would be some way of writing a wrapper library that did a lot of the connection and recovery when connections get broken, that would make a lot of this code a lot simpler. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, but I wonder if you can make if something like that is possible given all of the various permutations and setups you can do with BLE. Right. I still I, think and, you probably have to do some stuff like keep checking whether it's broken, but um, or maybe you can pass it a list of thing of connections or something, and it depends on whether you're a peripheral or a central. Um, and I should take a further look at this radio library because I, I think I skipped it when I was looking into things. I need to go back and visit that again. This is, right. but that seems like that's a kind of an example of what you're talking about. It's it's coming up with a, a, a specific use case and creating a very s simplified library for that use case. Well, I think there are two things. I mean, I think there's sort of like really simple use cases, which is like the radio library, which you could hide a lot of the details. Then there's the Blue Fruit Connect UART, right. Nordic UART service stuff, which also you can hide a lot of the details because it's just reading packets. So if the packet read fails, you can say, oh, let me try to reconnect. But in a lot of the libraries, like say the heart rate library, uh, we're exposing the service. So is there a way to hide, and, and the connection part of it is kind of mm -hmm. orthogonal to the service definition. So is there a way to say, here are, my, here are the services I want to connect to, or here are the services I want to provide, and then um, hide the details of the, of the connection and the recovery. Okay, and right now, so if you looked at like the, blue, the, the Piloton stuff or the heart rate monitor examples that are either in the guides or in the examples directory, can those be simplified? Can you use generalized? And that's really kind of an API design task, not just the guide writing task. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't, it took me a long time to realize that there's really two parts to BLE. There is the first part, which is just advertising and just broadcasting and just things come and go and you just get packets or you don't get packets. Uh, but then there's also like, you can initiate a connection and then that's when you feel like you should have more reliability and you should, but at the same time you can lose that connection. And that's kind of like a one-to-one -one connection um, where like advertising itself is like super powerful and it's much simpler because you don't have to worry about whether that connection exists or you want to reinitiate it or all that. You just, you get packets, you might miss packets, but you either get them or you don't and that's it. Um, and that's what like radio is all based on that first advertising bit, which is is much simpler, but it's also like um, you know less secure. All right. Okay. Let me let me ask it this way. So five O gets released. We've got several cool hardware platforms that have Bluetooth on them and it can mm -hmm. run Circuit Python. So people are going to buy that hardware and go, cool. I want to start playing with BLE. Right. Where do you point them? I think it's in general, like a lot of what we do is like, well, take a look at all the BLE guides and pick the one that is most similar to what you want to do. Yeah. Like, like, cause we have Apple media service, we have ANCS, the notification center. Um, like we have specific guides for a lot of these different things already. Okay. Yeah. That could be, so maybe we don't even need this guide because for the reasons you kind of mentioned before where display, I was like brand new and right. was meaningful to a guide. BLE not being like something new under the sun, but just our current specific implementation of it. Just a plethora of cornucopia of guides. Yeah, but I think there I think there would be a spot for like how do you add a new service? Because I think something that BLE in general has suffered from is that people don't understand the structures around it. And so like everybody just uses the Nordic Nordic UART service because they understand like the concept of a UART. Um, so I think there is a place for that. Um, but that could probably be like one specific good standalone guide, like service creation right. Versus, right. 
So trying to create just like a something equivalent to the display O guide for BLE may not be really, you know, a tractable problem. Maybe it's maybe just having our good set of examples is the way going to be the way to go. And I think uh, the other thing is that I think that there is that like generic, I can't find it because I can never find things on learn, but like there is a guide that K-Town wrote that is just about Bluetooth. Yeah. 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 Okay. And he he also wrote a book. (laughs) He also wrote a book. So it's that level of basics. It's nothing specific as circuit Python. It's no. more of this nomenclature and right. So there is this. This is Katney's guide. Right. So if but better, there's more. It, it's better to put effort into coming up with new guides and new examples of how to use BLE possibly. I think so. And it, and the reason I was excited for the radio stuff is I really think it's what most people want of just like broadcast a packet of some form that I control. And that's that. Right, right. It's more like how the, the micro bit does it. Could right. you the little the little firefly thing on the on the micro bits is really cool. And I think people would love to be able to do that. <laughs> right. And that's using the radio library. Right. Yep. I would like. Uh, I would uh, wonder if you could create create some kind of a, uh, a table of contents guide where you could list list off some of the uh, some of the more more uh, extensive uh, guides. Right. You know, so that you know, you could go to one. You'd have a guide that's a, a, that is a basically a contents. Of, a table of contents for all the other guides having to do with BLE. So you it would you jump from there to one that looks like you what you want. It was just a yep. idea. Okay, I th- I think you've answered my question. I, let's let's uh, say the answer is in general like no for now, for a a huge. BLE kind of guide um, and just see what happens. If we get more and more people that just seem to be not figuring out how to find their guides and then, you know, somewhere where we could put this table of contents would be nice. I'm not sure where that would be. Yeah. And we'll just see what happens. Yep. Anne's listening and she has ideas. Right. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, so, I met a guy. This, in that, it's, it's come up this, before too with, with things. Yes, it's not a foreign concept. It's all a matter of time and uh, resources. And uh, we've prioritized doing guides for uh, the new products because that is, people really, really want to have examples of using new products. So they, you know, like some companies some release companies a product really, and there's no, there's, there's no, uh, information on how to use it and they have to stumble around and we don't we tend to not like to do that so uh, um i can talk to uh management and see um, what they feel about it all right okay sounds good to me excellent and with that i think it is time to wrap up this has been the Circuit Python Weekly for February twenty fourth, twenty twenty. We uh, this meeting was hosted on Discord, um, and we're there all week. So if you want to chat with us, uh, you can join us at adafru.it/discord. That will get you the invite, and you will be able to join us and chat. We are here all week in the Circuit Python channel. Uh, this meeting is normally held on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and will be held uh, next Monday at the normal time. So thank you everyone to part- who participated, and thank you everyone who um, participated uh, uh, asynchronously by putting notes in the document. We appreciate all types, and uh, with that, um, we will see everybody next week. Thanks, everyone.
Have a good week.